Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this virtual media availability. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Gibby Harris. Gibby. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am waiting on Dr. Washington. He uh, was going to kick us off, so I see that he's on now. Hey, hey, hey. Can everybody hear me good? Yes, we can. My computer is uh, giving me grief. <laughs> I'll let you get us started, Reynard. All right, so, sounds good. good. Good morning, everybody. Great to be with you all today. Thanks for joining us for a brief update on where things are with COVID-19 here in the county. Um, uh, just to give a quick update on our trends, uh, we continue to see uh, pretty encouraging signs of, uh, of progress on all fronts. Um, all of our case counts are continuing to go downward. Um, we are um, at the point where we're seeing fewer than 200 cases a day, which is good progress from where we were previously. Uh, we're also seeing improvements in the number of patients we have in the hospital on a daily basis. Uh, that number continues to trend downward, as well as our percent positivity uh, is getting closer and closer to 6%. Um, and we look forward to um, this continued progress. Uh, certainly, as we are talking today, much of our discussion really is to continue to encourage our community to uh, to stay vigilant uh, so that we can continue to move uh, along this pathway of, of progress. Uh, I will quickly uh, also share that we are in the process of um, plan uh, of launching our um, home based test kit pickup at uh, local libraries. Uh, that initiative is uh, scheduled to start next week on Monday, November the 1st. Uh, so individuals are able to obtain at-home test kits uh, through this program at four library branches here in Mecklenburg County. Uh, they will be available on Mondays and Wednesdays at the uh, West, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, excuse me, at the West Boulevard location and the Hickory Grove location. And Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays, they'll be available at the South Boulevard and the Sugar Creek locations. Uh, that information is available on our website, mecnc.gov backslash COVID-19. Uh, these test kits are free of charge and, and, and do allow patients to uh, test themselves at home uh, pretty quickly. So uh, feel free to take advantage of those if you need a COVID test. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Gibby to give an update on vaccines as well as uh, a heads up on the Halloween season. Thank you. Um, and so, as you hear, we uh, are seeing improved trends in our numbers, which is great news as we move into the winter uh, months when we know there's a greater opportunity for viruses to spread. So hopefully our numbers will trend in, in the right direction as we move into the winter. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to stay focused on vaccines. At this point in time, we are 57 percent fully vaccinated in Mecklenburg County. Um, the good news is we're 68 percent fully vaccinated for those 12 and up. So all of those who are eligible for vaccines, um, we're at 68 percent, which is good news. Unfortunately, our 12 to 17 year olds are only a little over halfway vaccinated. So we know we've got room um, to work there over the next um, number of months. Uh, and what I will say is over the, the past two weeks, over close to 60% of the vaccines that have been given out in Mecklenburg County have been boosters. Um, so speaking of boosters, we do know that Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J are all approved now, and that individuals can choose which one of those they want for a booster if they're eligible for boosters. Those that are eligible include for J&J, &J, it's recommended for those over the age of 18 who have had a booster, I mean, a, a vaccine at least two months ago. So if you've had a J&J &J vaccine two months ago or longer, it's recommended that you do get a booster. And again, it can be any of the three that you choose. For Pfizer and Moderna, it has to be at least six months since your, your vaccinations were completed. And you need to either be someone who is 65 or older those 18 to 64 with certain medical conditions that put you at high risk, and those 18 to 64 who are at high risk because of occupational exposure or institutional settings. All of that information is on our website as well. We're eagerly awaiting 
final CDC approval on vaccine for those 5 to 11 year olds in our community. We know that there's a good bit of interest among our parents. And as soon as we know that this has been approved, we will be making vaccine available as soon as the vaccine is in our hands. So just to know that we are not able to give that vaccine out of the vials that we normally do for adults. We're getting a different vial of vaccine for children and we are um, expecting delivery of that next week from the state as soon as the CDC approves. We're working with our partners in the community on a rollout strategy for these vaccines. There will be numerous locations available for this vaccine. We will have events scheduled at this point in time on November 6th that will focus on families. So our 12 to 17 year olds, hopefully if approved, our 11 to, I mean, our five to 11 year olds and their parents, there will be at least nine sites in the community with our community partners where those vaccines will be available and potentially some additional sites at some of our schools. If you're interested, please look on our website. It will give you all of the information. And I do know that some of our partners have already started making tentative appointments for children. Others are waiting until final approval. But again, um, we're working closely with all of those partners. The November 6th date is the date that we're all keeping our fingers crossed. We've got vaccine, we're ready to go. And we will have those sites regardless, but hopefully the, the five to 11 year olds will be eligible as well. Um, I do want to just uh, remind people that, uh, I don't have to remind people that Halloween's this weekend, but remind people to be safe for Halloween. Um, we are uh, much more um, uh, encouraging of people to participate in Halloween this year than we were last year. If you remember, we were trying to be extremely cautious about how our children were out and about in the community. We still need people wearing masks. We still need you to think about trick-or-treating in small groups. And we still need you to be thinking carefully about what kind of indoor activities you participate in. If you're not vaccinated and are eligible, please get vaccinated. That's the best way to protect yourself and protect others. But again, as you've heard from Dr. Washington, we are still in widespread community um, involvement with this virus in our community. Masking continues to be important, especially in indoor settings. So enjoy Halloween, but do it safely. And um, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Director Harris and Dr. Washington. First question today goes to Brett Jensen, WBT Radio. Hey, give me a Dr. Washington. Um, just curious, because the state numbers have gone down drastically and continue to go down, um, and also because the, the head of uh, infectious disease for Novant said all the medical experts believe that these rates will continue to decrease through the spring because there isn't another variant out there that is as infectious. And with only a handful of counties having actually done a mask mandate, what will it take for you guys to lift the mask mandate um, in terms of the fact that 68% of those eligible have been vaccinated now, and uh, by most accounts, you know, two you know two percent away from being or uh, what would I guess be classified as herd immunity. So, what will it take for the mask mandate to dissipate? Um, that is a, an ongoing question that we're getting, Brett, uh, and I'm sure it will continue to be an ongoing question until the mandate's lifted. Obviously, within the current mandate that we have, we're focused on the data and we're looking at um, our positivity rate. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we're still in widespread um, community involvement with this virus, but we are seeing our numbers trend and it could be very soon where we drop below that widespread category. Um, we're continuing to look at CDC guidance on this and we're also having ongoing conversations with the county and with our board in terms of how we, um, how we address this issue moving into the fall. Um, I anticipate before too much longer that uh, we will be in a situation where we can reconsider um, and look at uh, what we recommend for masking. But at this point in time, even with 68% vaccinated, only 
like I said, a little over half of our 12 to 17 year olds are vaccinated and our younger children are not vaccinated at all. Um, and they're at risk on an ongoing basis because of that. So we'll, we'll continue to monitor that, um, that, that data and monitor the situation. Um, if you listen to Mandy Cohen yesterday, she mentioned the fact that the majority of our state is still in the red. So we still have a little ways to go before we can think about completely removing the mask mandate. And just a quick, in terms of numbers, I mean, and I know it's a moving target, so, but are, are you looking at 5%, 5.5%, 4%, 6%? Is there any specific target number that you're looking at? Um, the, the number, especially that's written into the rule at this point is 5% and below um, for some period of time. Um, obviously, if you're watching the data on a daily basis, that number fluctuates from day to day. So on any given day, we may be below 4%, and on another day, we may be above 8%. So we look at averages to try to, to figure out where we are in the community. Um, but 5% is the, is the number that we're focused on right now, which is consistent with CDC guidance. Next question, Chloe Leshner, WCNC. Hi, thanks so much. Kind of going off of that, do you have concerns that the other winter holidays like Thanksgiving, Christmas, where people typically gather more, could kind of interfere with these trends going downwards and then the mask mandate being removed eventually too? We're hoping not. Um, and to be perfectly honest, one of the biggest keys to this is people getting vaccinated. The more people we have vaccinated, the less likely we are to see those sorts of spikes as we move into the winter um, or those sorts of surges and increases. Um, so we're, we're just strongly encouraging people to get vaccinated. We hope that parents are going to step up and get their children vaccinated. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just be watching that carefully. Um, but again, people can also be safe in those types of activities by masking and making sure that they're um, they're being careful and thoughtful in the risk that they put themselves and their families in. Next question, Claire Donnelly, WFAE. Hi, Gibeon Raynard, thanks for doing this. Um, two questions. One is Mecklenburg's allocation initially from the feds next week for the kid vaccine, still 13,500. Uh, Dr. Cohen said a different number um, for the state yesterday. So I just wanted to check on that. And then number two, how has the booster rollout gone? How many people in Mecklenburg County have gotten booster doses so far? Raynard, do you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we are um, still anticipating uh, our initial shipment will be the 13,500. Um, and, uh, well, obviously, as Gibby mentioned earlier, that's subject to the final approval. And once the final approval and the shipment happens and we actually get it, uh, we'll know for sure if that's exactly what we're getting. Uh, but that's what we are anticipating. Um, and I think in terms of boosters, as uh, Gibby mentioned earlier, the majority of folks that we are seeing uh, at our clinics and most of our community clinics are individuals coming in to get a third dose or booster shot. Uh, and so uh, we certainly are seeing, uh, have seen an uptick in sort of activity at most of our vaccine sites, both ours at the health department as well as our other community providers. Um, and uh, I don't have an exact number of sort of to quantify how many folks um, have received their third dose of booster shot, but I uh, will certainly be, be happy to look and see what we can provide on that front. So I'm just looking at a report that we just received in um, uh, over the past two weeks, it looks like we've given in, in Mecklenburg County over 20,000 booster doses. Next question, Vanessa Rufus, WCNC. Hi, good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. I had a couple of questions. Um, the first was just a clarifying point regarding the mask mandate for the county. Um, so it's 5% and we saw it has to be there or below for 30 days. I'm just curious, is that 5% as a seven day average, a 14 day average? And would it count if it's rounding down to 5%, for example, 5.1%, 52 um, So that's my first question. Um, the, 
the way the uh, the rule is currently written, it's five percent over thirty days, um, and I don't believe we'd round that up. Um, so five percent or lower over uh, a thirty day period, and uh, that original rule was not written um, on a, a seven percent percent average. It was five percent each day for thirty days. Is the way the current rule is written. So, okay, I'm sorry, just, I have to clarify that one, one more time. So if we have 29 days of 5% and there's a day snuck in there where it's 7%, we start again? That's the way the current rule is written, yes. Um, there is, uh, there will be discussion about how we move forward with that. Um, but right now that's the way the current rule is written. Good to know. Um, okay, so my second question has to do with boostering. So obviously we're, we're, we're still tackling this first round, if you will, of boosters, um, but we are hearing from a lot of experts in the field who anticipate some sort of Delta targeted booster coming perhaps in the spring of next year. I'm just curious to see if y'all are already talking about that. Um, and do you anticipate, I know it's really early, but are we to the point where we're anticipating getting boosted every <laughs> six months now, or is this still maybe just going to be a yearly thing? Uh, that's a great question, Vanessa, and I don't know that we have an answer for you on that. Right now, we're just focused on getting um, first doses, second doses, and the boosters that we have in people's arms as quickly as we can. Um, so uh, there's, there's lots of speculation. Um, there's lots of uh, thoughts about potential for the future, um, but as you know, COVID has been a moving target since the beginning, and so we'll, we'll continue to try to stay on top of that, and if there's any additional information, we can provide it, but right now, we just don't have an answer. Next question, we're going to circle back to Chloe Leshner at WCNC. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify, are more people coming in for booster doses right now than just their initial series? And then kind of what are your thoughts on that and where we stand with vaccines going out in general? Yeah, so so certainly, as, as Gibby mentioned earlier, you know, in the last couple of weeks is the most recent data we have available. Um, roughly 60% of the doses that were administered were booster doses. Um, and roughly 18% of those were first time doses. So either a single dose of Johnson and Johnson or first of Pfizer and Moderna and 23% of them were second doses. Um, so the majority of folks coming in right now are for uh, third doses of boosters. Okay, back to Brett Jensen, WBT radio. Um, I guess this is for Dr. Washington, but uh, probably Gibby as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, the, the, the five to 12 year olds, the five and 11 year olds getting the booster, uh, do you understand why so many parents are hesitant to give a young child like that um, a booster something that's still, while yes, I understand it's proven, but they're, they're still, they, they may have apprehensions about that um, as opposed to like a 40 year old adult. And especially since they will say it's, you know, they're the ones least susceptible to that, you know, especially that age. And, you know, it's very rare for someone to, at that age, to go into ICU or to even to succumb to that and, and die. So do you understand why there's a hesitancy for mothers or parents to give their young children the vaccine? So I uh, just want to clarify that we're, we're not giving boosters to kids at this point. This was No, I don't mean the boosters. I'm sorry. I didn't mean the boosters. Okay. I mean, no, just no, like no. when it becomes available. Yeah, got it. Just wanted to make sure we were both talking about the same thing. Um, you know, certainly, uh, as you all know, we've seen vaccine hesitancy in every community across the board since the beginning of this uh, vaccine rollout. Um, and certainly, we've been doing everything we can to really address uh, that hesitancy in the, in the community, uh, from the boots on the ground to the work we're, do work we're doing sort of at a more of a systems level to get awareness about safety, effectiveness, um, and making it as easily available for people as possible. Uh, so nothing is different in, in the case with the kids. Certainly we will continue to do those activities. We'll continue to, to talk to folks, educate people, uh, provide easy access and opportunities to get vaccinated. I will say though, you know, we are, um, you know, 
while risk may be lower in children, there is no risk. Uh, there is not a situation where there's no risk. So uh, we have seen kids in intensive care. We've seen very young children, unfortunately, die to this uh, virus. Uh, and so certainly the risk of those complications is greater than the risk associated with the vaccine. And so we certainly encourage all families uh, to consider uh, the, the likelihood that there could be real, really severe complications due to uh, a COVID infection uh, and that protecting their kids and uh, through vaccination is the best chance they have at keeping them safe from any severe complications. So we will continue to, to, to tell that story and to make sure families know that it is important uh, as you know, with the Delta surge, we saw a lot more kids in the hospital, a lot more kids in the PICU, a lot more kids on, um, uh, you know, life-saving interventions to keep them uh, safe uh, while fighting the infection. And so certainly the risk of severe illness from the infection is, is greater than any uh, potential safety concerns with the vaccine. Brett, the one thing that I'll, the one comment that I'll make um, is that with our children, who have become infected, become ill, been hospitalized, and even with the deaths. You know, with our older population, what we saw is those folks with chronic conditions um, and uh, at higher risk were the ones who had the worst outcomes. That's not necessarily the case that we're seeing with children. Um, and so you can't look at a child and say, this one's more likely to have a severe complication from COVID than that one. And um, I, you know, as a grandparent, as a parent, uh, former parent, I'm not sure I'd wanna gamble with that with my child. Um, and that's why we will continue to encourage people to, uh, to think seriously about getting their children vaccinated. And if parents have questions, they need, they need to seek answers from individuals that they trust, but also from individuals that can provide them with good, solid information. They're pediatricians, um, they can call us, our hotline, have conversations about this. Um, you know, we, we strongly encourage parents to seek out that, that good, solid information to help them make that decision. We have a follow-up question from Claire Donnelly, WFAE. Hi again. Um, so any thoughts on why booster doses are the majority of people getting vaccinated right now? And then also, is anyone getting the initial J&J &J shot anymore? So, you know, with, with um, we had already seen some slowing in the number of people coming in for initial vaccines prior to boosters. Um, we've continued to see that, that lower level of folks coming in for first vaccines um, over time as, you know, as we got more and more people vaccinated, there were fewer and fewer people um, who were uh, making the effort to come in for first vaccines. So we continue to have to do extra work to try to help them understand the need and to get them in for the vaccines. So that's not surprising. And the main rush for the boosters, I think, is because they're now available. They weren't available before and people who are concerned about waning um, antibodies and increased risk are coming in for those boosters. So it, it's not terribly surprising, um, but we are continuing to stay focused on first vaccines as well as getting people in for the boosters. Next question goes to Eric Spanberg. Hey, Gibby, I wanted to ask you, uh, following up on things that uh, both, I think Brett and Chloe touched on, which you said that you know, the rates are going down. Uh, you could look at the masks, um, but then at the same time, we don't know how many rounds of boosters we'll need. So what I'm wondering is, you know that you need boosters, we know that people need boosters now. If the um, rate of vaccinations for those boosters lags in some way, does that create the opportunity for another potential widespread uh, round of infections, or is, is there any concern about that from, from your standpoint? I'd, I'd have to say is, you know, the people who are vaccinated still have antibodies. They still have protection. It may not be as strong as it was, um, but they still have protection. So we will, um, you know, I think that is, that's something that we um, are pleased with the number of the people that are fully vaccinated and we'll continue to try to recommend the boosters for individuals. Um, 
I think as we move forward and more information is out there about boosters and the need for boosters, people are going to be more interested in those. And as we make them more, um, continue to make them available in the community, I think there'll be a desire for those as well. I, I just don't think there's the rush that we saw with the initial vaccines um, because people recognize the fact that they still have um, antibodies and some level of protection. So um, we're hoping that, um, you know, as we get more people vaccinated and with a number of people, especially those who are most at risk getting boosters, that, um, that our community will be in a better place as we move through the winter. And, what, um, and we still have a, a, quite a few people who have been infected by the Delta variant who have some level of antibodies that will help us get through the winter as well. Um, but they still need to be vaccinated, even though they've had, they've had the virus. I have one quick follow-up, Gibby, which is I, I'm, I'm one of these uh, thousands of calls that you've done <laughs> in the past year or two. You, you mentioned that the uh, vaccination rate for flu shots, I, I think it was maybe 20 or 30 percent. It was pretty low. And I, I'm just wondering whether you have uh, additional concern about that this year, since I think they are forecasting, healthcare experts are forecasting this is going to be a little more severe flu year than last year. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. We probably should have brought up something about the flu before now. Um, we do have flu activity in North Carolina at this point. So we know we're going to have flu in, in our community this year. Um, last year, everybody was wearing a mask. People were indoors um, by themselves, uh, socially distanced. And uh, across the, the world, we had less of a flu year than we normally have. We're not sure that's going to be the case this year. So flu vaccines are important. People need to be getting those as well as the COVID vaccine. If um, so, uh, we we do need to be concerned about flu. It's not as dangerous a virus, obviously, as COVID has been, um, but it's still a virus that can cause um, severe illness in some people and death in some cases. So we want to make sure that people are protected against the flu as well. Thank you. You're welcome. The floor is now open for follow-up questions. Hi, really quickly, can you all just elaborate on the at-home tests that are going to be in the libraries? How many of those tests were there? will there be? Who should go and get one and kind of what the benefit of them will be? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we have a, um, I guess the best way to describe it is a stable supply of test kits. Uh, so we do have <laughs> enough and we have a, a we, we're being resupplied as uh, on a weekly basis. Our partners at the state are supplying the test kits for us. Um, and so they will be available um, pretty much until supply runs out on a weekly basis. Uh, we do think at this time, though, we do have enough supply to meet whatever demand may be there. Uh, these are meant to be a convenient option for people who um, need to take a test either because they're having COVID-like symptoms, uh, they are, you know, potentially were exposed to someone and want a rapid test, uh, maybe, and, and potentially can't afford to purchase one in, in uh, the pharmacy, for example, the over-counter ones, uh, or cannot access a testing site during those hours, but can pick up a test kit, you know, at six o'clock from the library. Uh, so certainly that it's meant to create another convenient access point. Uh, for those in our community who need uh, to take a COVID test for any reason, whether it be exposure um, or they're having COVID-like symptoms. Uh, and the convenience of it is that you can just pick it up without an appointment and you can do it at home and get a result there um, and you're able to uh, sort of move from there. Next question, Vanessa Rufus, WCNC. Hey, thank you for the follow-up. Um, I was just wondering, are y'all tracking like reinfections, um, people who maybe aren't vaccinated, got COVID during the first round, they got COVID now. Um, I guess I, I'm just kind of curious what we're looking at as far as like, if we don't get people vaccinated, are we just gonna continue to have this like certain group of people just getting sick over and over and over again? Yeah, I think globally speaking, you know, COVID is with us. I think you've heard us say this before, it's not just gonna disappear. Uh, so we're really sort of transitioning to a period where it's really becomes um, endemic or just here in our community on an ongoing basis. Uh, certainly we are tracking reinfections. And so we see individuals um, who are, the, based on the CDC guidance for reinfection, uh, they have to be at least 90 days out from their initial infection. 
Uh, and so we are keeping track of those cases um, and have been doing so for quite some time. Um, we are, uh, I think I'll just reiterate though, even with folks who've been previously infected and those who are vaccinated, we're all still at risk for being exposed and potentially infected. The risk of having or developing infection is obviously much less if you've been vaccinated by very large margins, uh, but we all still are at risk. And so as long as COVID is circulating in our community, uh, which we expect it will continue to just circulate as it is now, uh, we will have these periods of high transmission and periods of lower transmission. Uh, certainly it's expected that we'll need to, um, th those of us who are vaccinated obviously are gonna be at the lowest risk for being infected and ultimately getting really sick um, or any severe complications that might come with it. And then I just have a quick follow-up to that. I mean, we talked about moving from pandemic to endemic. Do you foresee any point in the near-ish future when people aren't, for example, if they're fully vaccinated, wouldn't have to quarantine for 10 days if they have like a very mild case or maybe even an asymptomatic case where they, they feel fine, they don't have a fever, et cetera, but for some reason test positive? Yeah, I think there, there, there's lots on the horizon in terms of how, how we respond to the pandemic, particularly as we're able to get the youngest of us vaccinated. Uh, and we have tools in our toolbox to be able to protect the majority of people in our population, uh, specifically, you know, vaccine for everybody. Um, I think we will handle COVID differently as a community. Um, and I know our federal partners and state partners are all having discussions now about, you know, what that transition looks like. At what point do we make that transition? Uh, but certainly, that, that is, there, are, there are a lot of uh, potential uh, changes that will be on the horizon in the next several uh, months to, to year. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next question, please. Have any further questions or follow-ups? I don't have a question, but I will follow up. Um, we uh, appreciate all of y'all, your efforts to educate our community to help get word out. And we, we appreciate the opportunity for you right now to help us get the word out about the importance of vaccines for all age groups, the importance of flu vaccines for all age groups, as well as um, the continued importance for masking at this point in time until we get our virus more under control in our community. So we appreciate your help. Um, and getting that word out to our community as, as we all work to battle this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Gibby. Any further questions today? All right, we appreciate your time. Thank you, Director Harris, Dr. Washington. We'd also like to recognize our American Sign Language interpreter for broadcast today, Meg Tucker. Have a great day. Thank you, Bill, and everybody else. Thank you. Oh.